Well, I am really excited about this topic tonight, and uh, it actually has been years in the making. Um, actually, it probably goes back to when I was in high school, just a few years ago, when I first heard about the second law of thermodynamics, and I was very confused by it. Um, I knew it had something to do with increasing entropy, but that's about as far as I, I got for a long time, and that just seemed like a kind of a no-brainer, and uh, so I moved on. But then, um, as the years have gone by, I have had the subject come up again and again, and uh, I have studied a lot. I have probably thought even more about it, because a lot of the stuff that I was discovering, there was really very little available. And... Um, it, it kind of culminated um, a, a year and a half ago when I completed and, and uh, uh, produced my uh, video. I call it my masterpiece video because it's, uh, it was so long in, in coming on the uh, second law of thermodynamics. It was called When Scientists Ignore Science, the second law of thermodynamics. And uh, so it was... Uh, never done for any kind of profit. It was just because I wanted to give a defense of the gospel, and, and that was a subject that was uh, super important, I felt. And uh, so the response has been very interesting. I have been online quite a bit um, debating with evolutionists, and um, I have also spent lots of time talking to creationist scientists and uh, putting this all together. Um, so the presentation tonight is essentially based on the video that I produced, and that is still going to be available online uh, on my YouTube channel uh, if you want to uh, review any of the things that I'm talking about. There's a lot to cover tonight. I'm going to go fast. I'm hoping to be able to leave enough time at the end for questions. Um, so um, we'll forge ahead. Now, some may ask, well, what are your qualifications? Uh, no, I'm not a PhD in thermodynamics, okay? Let's get that out of the way right now. I'm a layperson, I'm a non-scientist. But I love science, and I have been very interested in the topic of the second law of thermodynamics for such a long time. And I noticed that there were creation ministries, uh, AIG, CMI, that were recommending that uh, even creationists don't really talk about the second law of thermodynamics. And I think the basic reason is because they felt that very few people really have an adequate understanding of the topic to be able to take on an evolutionist on the topic. And so they were just suggesting that uh, creationists just kind of stay away from the topic. But they haven't entirely stayed away from the topic. Um, they have covered it here and there. But it's something that is very little understood. And what I have begun to discover is that scientists really don't get it, mostly. And um, creationists don't really get it, mostly. Um, now, the basics, yes, but not all the things that we're gonna be talking about tonight. Um, I think that my best credential here is that I am a, a non-scientist, because I'm hoping that that will allow me to talk all on the same level, so we're all on the same level, um, instead of talking over your head. I think that's going to be an advantage, not a disadvantage, especially when I have been online talking to uh, PhD evolutionists, atheists, and they have not been able to deal with the issues that I talk about. The only way they can respond to me is with ad hominem attacks, uh, not with actually talking about the issues. Uh, so I think I have some important stuff to cover, but I tended to communicate in concepts. Even when I was in college, that tended to be the way that I took notes. It wasn't to get at all the detail, it was to try and embrace the entire concept so that I knew what the whole subject was about uh, rather than just focusing on fine detail. So um, I don't know if any of you are uh, Three Stooges fans, but um, I am. And you know Mo, he's kind of famous for this line where he says, hey, what's a big idea? Well, what I hope to do tonight is to share some big ideas. We're not going to get into minutia. We're not going to talk about uh, applying the second law of thermodynamics to chemistry formulas. We're going to talk about the big ideas so that you can uh, get a handle on what this law is all about and how to uh, argue your case. Okay, so there are many people that I am indebted to, and I wanted to mention 
these three men. Um, I actually collaborated some with Dr. Brian Thomas. He actually has spoken here at this forum before. And I think in the interim, he's uh, acquired his PhD in paleobiochemistry. I have a copy of his thesis, and it actually pertains to the latter part of this presentation. Dr. Granville Sewell is a mathematics professor at the University of Texas, El Paso, and he's published on the second law of thermodynamics in mathematics journals. Um, and he's very knowledgeable about the second law. I've conversed with him um, mostly online. And uh, one of the statements that he made to me, he, he really liked my, my video and he said that uh, the second law of thermodynamics makes everything else moot. And he's right, that's been his topic, but it's law, it's scientific law. A lot of what we argue, we're making a case. But when it comes to law, it's like that's the end of the discussion. Law is law. And um, all I can really do is show you how it applies uh, because there's no real disagreeing with the law. It is scientific law. Um, and then Dr. Carl Wieland, who is the um, founder of CMI, um, Creation Ministries International, an established creation um, magazine and the Journal of Creation. Um, he uh, retired a few years ago. Um, but his wife still gets the emails for CMI for this one particular basket that comes in, and she saw that I had sent a link about my, my uh, documentary about the second law, and that was his thing. I had no idea at the time, but he wrote a book on the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, it's called World Winding Down. Um, but when she saw this email, she directed it to him, and he immediately watched it, and while he's watching it, he said that he did fist pumps in the air, and he said to his wife, this guy really gets it. <laughs> so I thought that was quite an affirmation. We had a series of, of email dialogues, so I was greatly, greatly encouraged by um, Dr. Whelan. Um, okay, so let's start the presentation. The second law of thermodynamics is a really big deal in science. Its effects impact every field of study, every aspect of our existence. It's inescapable and per pervasive, yet inexplicably, inexplicably the principle behind it is misunderstood by nearly everyone, including most scientists. Now many have learned a few definitions and even might be able to apply it to chemistry equations, but if you want to understand how the universe works, you need to go deeper than merely defining the second law of thermodynamics. You need to get the concept, the principle. And when you do, you will begin to understand everything in a whole new light. So during this um, next hour or so, I want to explain these principles that I believe will make such a difference in your thinking. To begin with, the second law of thermodynamics is not just about thermodynamics. Yes, it started with thermodynamics, Rudolf Clausius um, formalized the law, and I believe it was 1851, and what he was studying was heat and how um, heat escapes uh, in any event. And the arrangement of the, the energy was his primary concern um, and how heat dissipates. But within 20 years, Ludwig Boltzmann began to discover that the principle behind the second law of thermodynamics is actually based on statistical mechanics, mathematics, having to do with, with the way things are arranged. Um, and not just regarding, that he discovered the law had to do with that and not just with energy, but with everything. It's amazing how many scientists have not gotten a memo about this. But it didn't end with Rudolf Clausius. It went on and Boltzmann tied it to statistical mechanics. The law goes by many other names. It's been called the law of increasing entropy, the law of decay, the law of disorder, the law of spontaneous randomization, the law of probability gradients, and many others. The basic principle is this. Arrangements tend towards greater randomization over time. So this means that as time goes forward, everything winds down wears out, rusts, grows old, decays, disintegrates, disperses, 
dissipates and gets messed up. In fact, early thermodynamicists have described this thing called entropy as mixed upness. Within any given system, barring intervention that is, entropy will always increase. Spontaneous change towards randomness can be slowed down but never completely stopped. So the Bible was way ahead of its time 3,000 years ago when it was written, the universe shall wear out like a garment. Okay, that's great, but what are the big ideas that we want to talk about? Well, I get real excited about the second law, but I need to teach you six basic things that took me a long time to uncover and that will help you to understand the principles behind the second law. Okay, we have arrangement, arrow of time, entropy, constraints, defining the system, and last is entropy transfer mechanisms, or ETMs. Okay, so let's go with the first principle. Arrangements. The second law is all about arrangements. I had a PhD chemist try and tell me that the law has nothing to do with arrangements. And he's wrong. <laughs> uh, it, it is actually stated in physics tests. It is all about arrangements. If you don't get that it's about arrangements, you'll miss the whole thing. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. It has to do with arrangements of anything, energy, matter, even arrangements of information, anything. And more to the point, it's about statistical probabilistic arrangements of large numbers of things. Now the law doesn't tell us much about small ensembles of say five or six items because dumb luck can arrange small numbers like that pretty much any which way, uh, given enough trials. But probabilities become much more predictable as the numbers go up. For example, when you flip a coin, if you flip it just a few times, you have no idea what it's, what's gonna come up, what are gonna be heads and what are gonna be tails. Uh, or how many are going to go that way. But if you flip a coin a hundred or a thousand or five thousand times, uh, you're going to get pretty close to that 50 50 uh, mix on the, uh, the coin flips. That's basically the law of large numbers. It's, it's part of the math of statistics. So we're talking about arrangements of large numbers of things. When you think about it, large numbers are all around us. How many air molecules are in your lungs right now? How many grains of sand are on the beach? How many electronic bits in an internet transmission? How many microscopic parts make up your body? You see what I mean? There's lots of large numbers everywhere and they're all arranged. Some of these arrangements are very random, while some of them are very particularly specified for a purpose or a function. It is that idea of specified versus random that we're talking about. Now, some folks use the word order versus disorder here, but I really don't think that's a good idea because order is kind of in the eye of the beholder. Some people see patterns and they think of patterns as, as having to do with order. Um, but when we talk about specified, what we mean is that it is a very rare arrangement and it is for a purpose, or at least it's for a function. Uh, but that shows that that particular arrangement is there for a reason. And all of the other possible arrangements of the same uh, components um, are random as far as specification is concerned. So um, it is not so much order versus disorder, it is having to do with specified versus random, okay? So, um, the purpose can be derived from a specifier or an agent, but the purpose can also be derived from coherent functionality, like some of the molecular machines inside living things. To illustrate, the letters making up the text for Shakespeare's Hamlet don't appear to have any order to them by themselves if you just look at the letters on the page, but Hamlet is an extraordinarily improbable arrangement of characters, letters, intentionally assembled for the purpose of telling a detailed story. 
It is a specified arrangement, and any arrangement that does not tell the story would be random in this dichotomy. So again, it's the idea of specified versus random that we're talking about. Or we might even say purpose versus purposelessness. Okay, so it's all about arrangements. The second big idea, the arrow of time. The second law of thermodynamics requires an arrow of time. Time has a direction. And things go from random or from order to disorder, from specified to non specified uh, to a more random condition. And if it goes the other way, you know that something's wrong because time is not work, work, time does not work that way. The best way to illustrate that, I think, is with a little video of a glass falling and breaking. If it falls and it breaks, that's getting randomized, okay? But all you have to do is play the video backwards and you see what doesn't make sense for a, a bunch of glass shards to assemble themselves and then form themselves into a glass just doesn't make sense. It tells us the direction of time. If it's getting more random, it has to do with the very fabric of time itself. It randomizes stuff, it doesn't or, uh, specify stuff. And so this is exactly the reason why perpetual motion machines can't possibly work, because every motion is losing something in the process and time will not let you go back. So perpetual motion machines are impossible. When things degrade, they can't go backwards. They're getting more random. So time goes one way. It winds down and runs out. Sometimes slowly, sometimes quickly, but always the same direction towards randomness. So big idea number three, entropy. Um, the earliest definitions of the second law of thermodynamics were in terms of entropy. Uh, in other words, mixed upness or randomness, uh, all the same idea. For example, uh, if, you, if you look at the definition here on the screen, in an isolated system, total entropy must increase over time. So entropy is supposed to quantify the randomness, but how might that be done? Well, at first it was the arrangement of energy that Clausius was trying to describe. So he said that the amount of heat that is lost in a process would be equivalent to the randomization of that energy. And so he defined energy or entropy change as being the uh, energy lost in joules divided by the temperature in degrees Kelvin. And that became the, the uh, quantitative measure of entropy for Clausius, but it only had to do with energy. But then, after 20 years go by, then, then Boltzmann starts dealing with the statistical mechanics of everything. And he's looking at the math. And he's looking at um, particles, uh, molecules to be specific. He, and he studied the behavior of gas molecules uh, in containers and it helped him to understand the organization or, or the lack of organization of um, gas molecules and how they get randomized. And he um, came up with, and actually it was kind of a long process of coming up with this formula, but it's a formula to define entropy in absolute terms. And you'll notice it's, it's a summation symbol and it's a logarithmic uh, formula. And then in front of that, um, that function is a constant. This is the now famous Boltzmann constant. Apparently they went back and put the Boltzmann constant right on his headstone because he was so famous for it. In that uh, as, as um, his um, work had been expanded, uh, like by um, um, Max Planck in particular, um, then this became clearer and clearer that this constant is very special. It actually is used in many other formulas as well. Okay, so Boltzmann was able to quantify with his formula and with the constant in front of it, he was able to get the exact same number that Clausius had without the constant. And it's quite a discovery actually because we're talking statistical mechanics regarding arrangements. He was studying gas molecules, he wasn't studying heat. 
But he comes up with the same result. Pretty amazing. And then less than a century later, we have Claude Shannon, who is uh, studying and, and uh, teaching about information. And he comes up with basically the same math to apply it to information. And his formula looks like this. Now, of course, he doesn't have the Boltzmann constant. He didn't need to convert it to anything. So there are no units on the formula, but it's essentially the same formula. And, you know, that's basically informational entropy. There's a lot more we could say about that, but maybe if we have time in the Q&A, we can do that. All right, so the bottom line is that entropy is not just about heat dissipation. It's about probabilistic statistical arrangements. Now notice that the early definitions were framed in terms of entropy with the thermal entropy um, specifically in mind rather than non-thermal entropy. entropy. Uh, but a, a more comprehensive definition was needed because it has to do with more than just heat loss. So here's the definition for the generalized form of the second law of thermodynamics. In an isolated system, the direction of spontaneous change is from an arrangement of lower probability towards an arrangement of higher probability. In, you might notice the absence of the word entropy in there. Um, the concept is still important, but um, you might want to even make notes and write this down. I'm going to put it up on the screen multiple times, um, but this is what the second law of thermodynamics is. It's not just about heat. It has to do with the direction of change toward a more probable arrangement. That's what the law is about. I said entropy is still important to, to talk about because even though we don't do calculations typically on non-thermal entropy, uh, the idea of it is important to understand because entropy is a um, relational property like um, temperature. It's not an intrinsic property like, say, mass. Okay, so this means that entropy has location. It has spatial aspects to it. Now, the reason this becomes important is because there are some really ignorant scientists out there. They're supposed to be really smart, and they think that entropy can simply be compensated for. So if you have a decrease in entropy in one part of the universe, as long as entropy increases somewhere else in, across the galaxy, you've still kept the, the second law of thermodynamics. But this is nonsense, because entropy has location. You have to have a causal chain of connection. It's not hocus pocus. You know, you can't just change entropy here, pop it down here, and have it pop up over here. That's not the way it works. You have to transfer it. Um, you can move it out of a locality, but you cannot just make it poof, disappear, and pop up somewhere else. So there is location to entropy. All right, let's go to the next big idea. Concept number four, constraints. Arrangements randomize over time, but it must be understood that pure randomness probably does not exist. Randomization is slowed and guided and bounded by physical constraints that come from physical properties and natural laws. Such constraints on randomization are actually the rule, not the exception. Thankfully, most randomization occurs slowly because of these constraints. If it didn't, the whole universe would probably just go poof and disappear <laughs> uh, in a big vapor. But randomization is narrowly is narrowed within constraints. So constraints on randomness can take many forms and they can act in many different ways. For example, if you blow up a balloon, you've got the air molecules compressed inside the balloon. It is a less probable arrangement to be compressed when the outside air is more probable and so the air would like to get out, but it's constrained by the balloon. Or in this case, constrained by putting your fingers on the, um, the balloon. And if you remove your fingers, it releases that constraint and the air rushes out into the surroundings where it's more probable. Now, if you want to make, if you want to remove the constraints more quickly, then all we have to do is stick a pin in it and then we see how fast the second law of thermodynamics can actually work when there's no constraints. Now, constraints take other forms too. Let's, let's do a thought experiment here. How about if we take a drop of ink and we drop it into the ocean? What happens to the ink? 
it disperses. Maybe not as quickly as a pop balloon because you've got viscosity to the water, but it disperses throughout all that water. And you can never get an eyedropper and put it in the water and, and expect to suck up that ink again. It's dispersed. That's the second law. But it doesn't happen as quickly. Or what if the, what if the ocean was syrup, thick syrup? Then you put that drop of ink in it, and you would expect that it would dis, dis, dissipate uh, much more slowly than it would in just regular water because of the viscosity of the syrup. Or maybe we want to make it oil. Again, we change the viscosity. We drop some ink in there. Now, here we have a little bit different because the ink is, is water-based and it is heavier than the oil. And so it's randomizing all right, but it's randomizing on the way down because the oil is pressing it down. That's a different kind of a constraint. But you still get the idea that there are various kinds of constraints on randomization, but it is still randomizing um, stuff that's going on. You can stir up a stew in a pot, but it's constrained within the pot. And so it goes. You can have, um, you know, keep your, uh, your um, food in jars and try and preserve it, and you can preserve it for a while, but you can't preserve it uh, in infinitely. Randomization will always occur everywhere in the universe, but always within the physical constraints that may be present. Arrangements spontaneously follow the probabilities toward randomness within constraints. That might bear repeating because that really summarizes quite a bit. Arrangements spontaneously follow the probabilities towards randomness within constraints. That's how the second law works. All right, let's go to the fifth big idea. Defining the system. Now you may have noticed both the original and the generalized law, uh, as, as they're written out, includes a caveat in their definitions. And that caveat is in an isolated system. When we talk about increasing entropy or randomness, it's reasonable to ask what number and within what limits. That's what that is there for. It's a mental construct for understanding the second law. But many people have claimed or misunderstood or something, and they think that when it says an, in an isolated system, that that's a limitation on the law. It is not a modifier of the law. It's a modifier of the probability calculations or the entropy calculations. If you are talking about an increase in something, you have to be able to measure it. So you have this caveat, an isolated system, purely for that reason. It is not limiting the effectiveness of the law. The law is going to work no matter what. But you need this to be able to even talk intelligently about what's going on. If entropy is increasing, well, what entropy? Within what limits? What boundaries? What if we say, how long is a piece of string? You need a little more information, right? It's not enough. So that's the basic idea of in an isolated system. It's that, that um, mental construct that helps us to know what it is we're measuring and what it is we're even talking about. Okay, so the isolated system is not because you um, are keeping things out. It's because uh, those are the boundaries you're choosing for your, your given um, definition of entropy. You could have a system that is of the entire universe. The entire universe entropy is increasing, that's true. Or maybe your system is the solar system, or maybe it's the Earth, or, you know, the Earth's biosphere, and that's going to become your system. Or maybe it's just the room in which you're doing your experiments, then that's your system. But talking about an isolated system has to do with, with how you're defining your entropy, not with whether or not the law works. The law works everywhere, always, without exception. Okay, there are some, I don't think they're ignorant, I think they're just being cute. They, they use it as a loophole. They say, oh, we don't have to pay any attention to the law because we don't have a closed system. It's an open system. Well, my goodness, everything is closed. Nothing is a true isolated system. 
That, we wouldn't even have a law then if that's, if that's the way that works because nothing is an isolated system, therefore there is no law. You know, but there, it's, it's just a loophole. It's, they're just playing games. The law is the law. And there's a principle, people, not a loophole. And it is that arrangements tend toward greater randomization over time. Whatever system you're talking about, this is the law. Okay. Big idea number six. Now, this is uh, going to pull some things together. Entropy transfer mechanisms, our sixth and final concept. Given all this, we have to ask, why are there so many ordered system, systems on our planet? Somehow, only on the Earth. Are there human brains and computers and spacecraft? You don't see that on other planets. All this order and all this specification that's going on on our planet. And you look at how the Earth is teeming with life. Life is so incredibly complex and so deliciously specified. And you look at even an individual cell, it's like a total city with all the different functions that go on in a cell. The order is just remarkable, the, the, uh, the specification. And then you get to a finer level to the, the individual molecular machinery inside the cell. It's just mind-blowing. So how can such low probability, low entropy things and that's essentially the same idea, you understand. Low probability, low entropy things even exist, never mind why. I mean, the rest of the universe isn't like that. So what's so different about the Earth? The second law can't be broken, but it seems to be in living things, right? So what's going on? Well, the answer lies not in a loophole, but in the nature of the law itself in arrangement probabilities. We have local localities where entropy can decrease while the, the, um, basically the waste from that is going out into the surroundings. So entropy increases in the surroundings while it's decreasing in a locality. We know that that goes on. That's exactly what living things do. You know, they'll, they'll have very low entropy things going on inside that cell but then you have, you have the waste products and, and so on. So we can intervene in the second law by altering probabilities in a locality. Remember our law says, you know, in an isolated system. So intervention can happen and we can increase local probabilities for a given specification by what uh, Peter Atkins has called mechanisms Andy McIntosh has written about this and called them just machines. Granville Sewell spoke about it as X-entropy or transfer entropy. And I have coined a different term. I call it entropy transfer mechanisms. And we're all really talking about the same idea, but I like mine best because it's more descriptive of what's actually going on. An entropy transfer mechanism, it's transferring entropy out of a locality into the surroundings. That is what an entropy, mecha entropy transfer mechanism, or an ETM, does. Um, it is not merely an input of energy, but a mechanism that harnesses that energy to dramatically increase the probability of a specified arrangement in a locality while dumping that excess entropy out. Okay? You have to harness the energy. Energy by itself is not enough. So these ETMs make use of the law itself through probability modification and therefore transferring that entropy out. The law remains intact and sophisticated organization within a locality can be the results. result. This is basically what living things do. Otherwise we might ask how can anything even live? But clearly things do live. And it's because there are so many entropy transfer mechanisms within that are altering probabilities and making things happen. How about some examples? How about the photosynthesis mechanism? This is an ETM. It harnesses the sun's energy and it manufactures um, energy, it, it manufactures um, 
tissue, right? And um, energy for the plant. This photosynthesis process, it's really an amazing thing. And it's, it's kind of the, uh, the counterpart to in living things, we, or in um, animals, we have mitochondria, uh, and we have the ATP synthase molecule uh, turbine engine, and it's essentially the same process is going on to, to make the plant work. Living things are full of these kinds of ETMs, billions of them, literally, and every cell has lots and lots of ETMs. Now think about what life is made of. It's made of enormous molecules. The rest of the universe is made of pretty small molecules. But living things are way different. Mostly uh, made of protein, but there's several categories of molecules. They're all really huge and really delicate and really intricate. And those molecules have to be built. They, they don't just come together when you stir stuff up in a pot. It doesn't do that. They're very complex and you have to painstakingly build them. So when you have molecular machines inside the cell, that can be accomplished because they are ETMs, they're um, entropy transfer mechanisms. A series of entropy transfer mechanisms in the, in the zygote, in the womb, develops a human being. These are amazing mechanisms that can do this. Entropy is decreasing in the womb while it's increasing in the surroundings. Uh, just remarkable. Now, it might help if you understand an entropy transfer mechanism, an ETM, as a factory. Factories build things. But that's not all they do because they have, um, they have to intake some, some materials, they have to, to um, get rid of the waste products, they have a smokestack sometimes and um, waste going out that way. Um, and that's the way an ETM works. It does not decrease entropy in total, but it decreases the entropy in the product it, that it's actually manufacturing. We have those kinds of factories inside living things. Amazing molecular machines. Now, what about these um, ETMs? Aren't they subject to the law too? Yeah, they are. ETMs deteriorate and they decay. And then they have to be uh, replaced by ETMs that build other ETMs. That's why living cells have to die and then the, the body makes, makes more. Um, but these molecules are delicate and they break down and the ETMs themselves break down over time. And that's why um, we break down and we eventually die. Okay, now we know from biology that, that living things are based in information. These ETMs are based in information. And that information is contained, uh, at least uh, some of the information is contained in DNA molecules. And these molecules are extraordinary. Um, it is di literally digital code. And the arrangement of the nuclei nucleotide pairs is just incredible. Now, if you look at this little diagram of, of DNA, you see maybe, well, it looks like a, a twisted ladder, doesn't it? If you look at, there's like rungs on the ladder, and each rung represents a nucleotide pair. And uh, these can be characterized as letters. They use the letters A, C, T, and G. Uh, and, and the sequence of those letters is what determines the code. It's just fantastic information. Now, the, what you're looking at on the screen is about a dozen of these rungs, but you need to understand that the entire molecule is not shown here. The entire molecule has three billion of these things. This molecule is huge. And all of that is providing information that can do all these ETM functions. Now, we know that the ultimate ETM is intelligent mind. When uh, a mind comes up with an idea, a mind can alter probabilities in a locality in accordance with the second law, like nothing else can. Um, and, it's, and it's generally the source for the other ETMs uh, down the line. Now, what about evolution? How does the second law pertain to evolution? Um, well, in many ways. And um, we want to address that uh, mostly for the rest of the, of the talk. 
um, we want to apply the formula of, of um, the second law to evolution, but there are so many evolutionists that just will not even look at this. And that's one of the things that startles me, is when you want to have a discussion with them about it, their approach is to either make an ad hominem attack and you know, basically say, they'll argue, well, um, Mark is not as intelligent as I am, therefore evolution must be true. Does that make any sense? That's a pretty, pretty weak argument. Um, I've found that so many evolutionists are very brilliant people. They're very, very intelligent, but they don't know how to think. Their critical thinking skills are weak. And it comes out so often when I'm dialoguing with them online. It's like, wait a minute, you know all this stuff, but you can't put this together? Um, but basically, they don't want to discuss the second law of thermodynamics because they have no answers for any of this stuff. Basically, creationists have been uh, bullied into not going there. But I, th I am recommending that we go there. Okay? So the response of evolutionists typically is to kind of shrug their shoulders and make some kind of an excuse. Well, we don't have to worry about it because, oh, well, Richard Dawkins says, because of the sun. I mean, because of the sun, then we shouldn't even talk about second law of thermodynamics. It doesn't even apply. What? No, that's not a free pass. But that's the way they respond, and you can almost hear them going, loophole, loophole. You know, they, they somehow have gotten around the verbiage and, and so they are just going to ignore the whole idea. And to them, the magic ingredient is the sun. Well, folks, the sun's rays are extremely random. They are not ordered. And so when you have random coming in, it's all it's going to do is make it worse. I mean, having energy is fine, but it's not going to solve the problem. What you need is specification, not random. Now, Granville Sewell, um, the mathematician that I mentioned earlier, he has, has come up with two scenarios that help to explain this. Um, and the two scenarios have to do with, an, with a tornado. So in the first scenario, we have a tornado hitting a house and turning it into a pile of rubble. Okay, that's scenario number one. The second scenario that he proposes is to have a, another tornado with exactly equal energy coming and striking the pile of rubble and building a house. Okay, now, both of these scenarios are open systems. They both have energy input, right? But we know that the first scenario is reality and the second scenario is fantasy. Random begets random. It doesn't have anything to do with how much energy is there. Now, but yet we could think of a solution to this because we can imagine if there was a, a crew of carpenters that were very resourceful, it's conceivable that they might go and gather up the rubble and rebuild the house. And they would serve as an ETM because they would make the probability of that constructed house much more probable. But a tornado isn't making it more probable at all, is it? Remember, the law is about probability of arrangements. So, as I said, intelligent mind is the ultimate ETM. Like these carpenters, intelligence has the ability to improve the probability of functional specified arrangements like nothing else can. So that gives us a question. What ETM could conceivably build DNA code? Three billion nucleotide pairs in a very particular sequence that encodes for how to build whatever the organism is. You have something that looks very much the same that gives instructions for building a sponge and another arrangement of those nucleotides give you a human. It's fantastic. It's incredible information. We know how important it is. Every evolutionist knows this. So the question I have for the evolutionist is, okay, what do you propose as the ETM that's going to build this? 
not just make copies, but actually build the information, build the whole genome. I'm waiting. And then comes the answer. Uh, uh, uh. Random mutations, random. That's the way that we build a genome is with random, with random mutations. And I have to say, oh man. You're grasping at straws. Random does not work as an ETM. An ETM is the polar opposite of random. If you want to have an ETM, you do anything but be random. Random is not an ETM, but that's all they've got. That's all they've ever proposed. That random is what builds the genome. Now, look at this. Is this going forward or backwards in time? It's backwards, it's not real. <laughs> Random does not specify. It does not even specify three words, let alone three billion nucleotide pairs, like random mutations are supposedly doing. What random does is it damages the information and does things like this to our genome. It makes a mess of things. Random is the opposite of an ETM. Now, this is very strongly supported by Dr. John Sanford, who wrote this book, Genetic Entropy, and I highly recommend his book. Um, in that book, among many other things, he talked about um, decay, uh, a, a genetic decay curve, and how the genome is in decay. And basically every um, population geneticist knows this. Um, by the way, I've been learning some things specifically about this when it comes to mitochondrial DNA, that portion of the DNA, DNA that's in the mitochondria, and Y chromosome DNA. Because most of the genome gets all mixed up, you know, through the generations, but mitochondrial DNA is passed from mother all the way through. And so it doesn't change. And Y chromosome is from the father, and it's passed all the way through, and it never changes except for degradation over time, the second law. And that happens slowly, but it happens. And the rate at which it happens, they can use to calculate backwards because by looking at how vast the differences are from one person in the population to another, then they say, well, each step outward would have to be, if you go back in time, would be a step back. And they can actually say, mitochondrial Eve was 6,000 years ago. And in the same way, looking at the degradation of the Y chromosome, you go back to uh, Y chromosome Noah, 4,500 years ago. It's really pretty remarkable stuff. And Nathaniel Jeanson from AIG has been doing some work on this. A more recent book by um, Michael Behe has also substantiated this uh, called Darwin Devolves. And basically the molecular uh, data that's coming in is showing us that Genomes are devolving, not evolving. Yes, change is happening from generation to generation, most certainly, but it's downhill. It's devolving. That's what the second law predicts. And interestingly enough, I was reading some of Granville Sewell's stuff, and that's exactly what he said, is this book is exactly what the math predicted would, would be true. So then along comes the evolutionist, evolutionist and he says, but, 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 but this is not really random. It's not really random because we have natural selection. Oh, there you go again. <laughs> Ran uh, natural selection is not the end of random. It is a constraint on random. It, it guides the randomness, but ra it's still random. You understand that? It's, you're restricting the, ra I mean, just like a balloon in the air in the balloon, you're restricting it, but it's still random inside the balloon, right? Uh, so natural selection, um, yes, it is a constraint on random, but it does not end randomness. It's still random. Natural selection does not build anything. It kills, it culls, it destroys, it ruins um, reproductive systems. Random begets random. Very basic idea. I don't think most people realize 
the vast difference between a specified arrangement and a, and a non-specified arrangement. If we look at the number of possible arrangements that cannot live, some have estimated that to be something like 10 to the 40,000th power. That's 40,000 zeros <laughs> after the number. Arrangements that cannot live. And there's almost, you know, zero compared to that of arrangements that do live. Now we know we have, what, a few million species on the earth and that they can all live, but it's such a tiny number compared to the number of arrangements that cannot live. And in this very same way, this is how the, the second law of thermodynamics works. It goes away from the, the improbable and it goes towards the probable. The probable is in that 10 to the 40,000th power. Douglas Axe described this number as uh, this kind of number as being fantastically improbable. Technically, it's not a zero probability, but for all practical purposes, it's a zero probability because there's not enough probabilistic resources in the, in the history of the universe to give enough trials to have any opportunity for this kind of thing to happen on its own by chance. I could give some examples like this, this room is full of air and it has nitrogen and oxygen. Could all the oxygen in this room just suddenly go up into that corner? Yeah, it could. But the second law of, prob uh, second law of thermodynamics says the instant it does that, it'll immediately be, be back again because randomness prevails. Everything moves towards randomness. So simply, uh, for an evolutionist to simply say that, well, something improbable can technically happen, um, not really, not according to law. All right, now let's step this up a little bit. What about the actual evolution mechanism itself? Okay, the neo-Darwinian mechanism is basically three components. It's a trial and error type of mechanism, and, and Darwin said that it was numerous successive slight modifications. So the basic way the mechanism is supposed to work is that you have genetic accidents or random mutations inadvertently write a little bit of coherent integrated functional genetic code by incredible rare luck. And then natural selection preserves those lucky mutations. And because there's so many of these, they, they have to go over millions of years in order to be accomplished. So mutations, natural selection, millions of years. That's, that's what they're hanging their hat on. That's what they think is, is gonna work. Okay, well let's, let's break that down in light of what we have learned about the second law of thermodynamics. Okay, let's go with the first one. Random mutations. Can random mutations write genetic code? I think we've shown they can't. It's an actual absurdity. It doesn't even make any sense because scrambling is the opposite of specifying. You say you're gonna, you're gonna write a, a book by not writing. It, it makes no sense, it's a non sequitur. And it's, it's not only that, but it is uh, an illusion for them to even suggest such a thing uh, it's, it's, it's trickery, it's sleight of hand. Now Darwin really didn't know anything about genetics. Um, genetics was just in its infancy at the time. Um, but he used words like, um, what was it, descent with modification and, and random variations, but he didn't really understand the mechanism. But today, uh, evolutionists will, will talk about uh, mutation as being that form of the variation. So are random mutations supposed to write code? Not possible. It can't write code. It does the exact opposite. Okay, we've already talked about this, but what if you had a barrel of Scrabble letters and you wanted to write the complete works of Shakespeare by dumping them out on the floor? You know, in what universe is that possible? No, the second law prohibits that. And yet that's what they're saying happens with, with uh, DNA. Now, suppose you were having alphabet soup and this word appears in the top of your soup. Whoa, that's a lucky mutation. Look at that, it spells out a word. But then a moment later, your soup looks like that again. Um, now, that is basically what happens. You could get really lucky with a very short word, 
But if you ever had a statistics class and you've studied the way probabilities are calculated, you know that you don't have to add too many letters uh, before it becomes fantastically improbable. And um, especially, like, what if your alphabet soup, you want it to, to give you the recipe for alphabet soup? Is that ever going to happen? Ever hear of anybody finding a, a recipe in their soup? I don't think so. Okay, now what about beneficial mutations? Uh, John Sanford actually talked about beneficial mutations in his book. But I think we are misunderstanding words here because, uh, remember, a mutation is damage. So can you have beneficial damage? Well, the answer, strangely enough, is yes, you actually can. And the, the uh, mutation that um, stops malaria by uh, creating sickle cell is an example of that. People with sickle cell um, mutation actually can't, can't get uh, malaria because even the malaria protists don't like, don't like it. <laughs> so what you've done is you've caused genetic damage and you've stopped malaria with it. The only problem is both parents have that, that uh, mutation, then you die of sickle cell disease. So that's not a, a good thing. But it, in, in a, a certain situation, yeah, it's possible that harming a gene can be beneficial. But uh, not normally. But this is the same kind of thing that goes on um, in many cases with the, um, the so-called um, resistance to uh, antibiotics of bacteria. And some of those things fall into that same category. But mutations are genetic damage. They are always informationally harmful, even if they are situationally beneficial. Now, it, again, it's damage. So uh, here's an example of a beneficial accident or beneficial damage. What if this is Hitler's car? That's definitely a beneficial accident, right? Not so good for the car, but it's a beneficial mutation, I guess. But um, no, really, when we talk about beneficial, we have to be careful to, to spell out what we're talking about. It is, you know, it can do some things to the genome, you know, it, it can um, cause a, a grizzly bear to turn into a polar bear and things like that by damaging genes. That's what Michael Behe actually discussed in particular. But it's not going to create X-Men, you know, it's only going to be helpful if damaging a gene is is good for a particular situation, but it is always informationally harmful. Okay, it's not just informational entropy that's in play, it's also conventional thermal entropy that comes to bear on the molecules themselves. As I said, molecules in living things are very complex, they're huge, they're intricate, they're delicate, we have proteins that are amazing. We have DNA, like I said, three billion nucleotide pairs. And when you look at the actual thermal entropy issues and the chemistry of it, big molecules like this have a high level of what is called Gibbs free energy. The chemistry of this means that these big molecules tend to want to break down into their constituent molecules that have lower free energy. That's the way the chemistry works. So for these, these chemicals to simply come together and form these big molecules on their own, it's, it's not going to happen, you know, unless there's a lot of work. And even then, now James Tour uh, has been talking about this recently. He is a synthetic chemist. He says thermodynamics is the biggest challenge to synthetic chemistry in trying to build these molecules. Um, it's very hard in the lab to make even fairly small molecules that would be of this sort. But we have not been able to make true, uh, you know, big molecules like in, like a three billion nucleotide pair DNA. No, we've never done it. Can't do it. It's too hard. But we have molecular machines inside living things that can do it. But other than that, you're going to get biomolecular decay. You're not going to get stuff getting built. Now, there's one other thing. I don't know if I want to spend too much time on this, but this is something I've learned since the, um, the documentary video uh, was produced, and that is the idea of chirality. We know that in amino acids, all, or, or in uh, proteins, all of the amino acids that make up the protein are left-handed, not right-handed. 
And in the sugars, like along the spines of the DNA, all those sugars are right-handed. And there's no, no mixture. You don't have any right-handed amino acids that are involved in proteins. So uh, what's, what's with that? Why is that important? And that actually became an issue back in the 1953 experiments, you know, the Miller-Urey experiment, because the result was an amino acid that was a mixture, a racemic mixture is what they call it, half and half mixture uh, of left and right handed. Well, we never really understood what was so important about that until recent years. And James Tour talked about this because this has come out of quantum physics. Did you know electrons have spin? And it's not the same sense of the word as spin as we usually use, but they have spin. They would have like a clockwise or counterclockwise spin. And by having all left-handed amino acids, it aligns the spin. And it turns out that having all that spin align is what makes reactions happen super fast inside the cell. If you had a mixture, a racemic mixture, it couldn't work. Not to mention the problem of the protein not being able to fold properly, but just the reactions that would be slowed down would kill you. So, I mean, this is just amazing stuff. But when you talk about, you know, having to have all the molecules uh, of one chirality, like what if you took a, a, a big bulldozer type thing and dumped a bunch of coins into a gymnasium and it was several feet deep and you say, well, but they all need to be heads. Not likely, is it? <laughs> this is the amazing thing about living things, though. This is the way God designed it. It's just fantastic. All right, let's go to the next step in the neo-Darwinian model. Natural selection is supposed to preserve those very, very lucky mutations that they can't get, but they think they can get. So what about natural selection? Well, the origin of species came out in 1859, and right on the cover page, it says the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life. Preservation? No, preservation is not possible according to the second law of thermodynamics. It's like a perpetual motion machine. You cannot stop decay. You can slow it. You can't stop it. This is impossible. And yet it's the basis of his entire book. It's like a doctor with a shotgun and he's going to go kill all the sick people. Does that make everybody happy? You know, this is really ridiculous. And the fact that Darwin missed this, he thought that somehow natural selection could could preserve uh, a, a mutation well, or whatever, his, whatever he conceived of as a mutation, preserve a trait. It doesn't preserve traits, it kills traits. It kills other traits, but it doesn't preserve the ones that are desirable so, um, or effective. So the whole idea of natural selection being a preservative is completely wrongheaded and it's completely false. And it's the whole idea of Darwinism. Even if we had mutations that were good, it does, they don't get preserved. <laughs> now we talk about preservation, in, in normal conversation when we, when we talk about pre preservation, we know that it doesn't mean it's gonna preserve something forever. We can slow the degradation, like grandma's strawberry preserves, we call them preserves, and it does extend the life of the strawberries, of course, but not forever, they eventually go bad. And we try things like freezing and formaldehyde and the like, but none of this really preserves. It just slows down the degradation. So when Darwin has this on his book cover, uh, it just makes me crazy. <laughs> All right, so, so far we have established that the second law blocks genetic instructions being created randomly. The second law blocks huge molecules from being created randomly. And the second law blocks preservation by natural selection. So there's only one thing left in the list and that is millions of years. <coughs> Pardon me, millions of years. So because those numerous lucky mo mutations are so rare and there's so many of them, then it takes millions of years for all this to happen. And they're counting on long periods of time. 
Well, Dr. George Wald was a, um, a PhD in, uh, I think it was in medicine or physiology, and he made the following statement famously. He said, given enough time, it, evolution will almost certainly happen at least once. Time is in fact the hero of the plot. Given so much time, the impossible becomes possible. The possible, probable, and the probable virtually certain. One has only to wait. Time itself performs the miracles. Oh, man. Just think about this. This is a brilliant scientist who's won the Nobel Prize, and he says time is the hero of the plot. Has he ever heard of the second law of thermodynamics? Has he ever heard of the arrow of time? It's science. It's hard science. It's law. Science is not the hero of the plot. It's the enemy of the plot. And even if time was going to help you out, you wouldn't have enough of it. No, you wouldn't have enough iterations to, to do all these, uh, these um, trials to get what you wanted, a simple protein of 125 amino acids. The chance of that organizing itself is four times 10 to the 162 power. Remember, there's 10 to the 80 power atoms in the whole universe. And that's how lucky you have to get to get us one simple protein. There's not enough time, folks. So the second law crushes millions of years. Okay, so now although we can see the generalized second law of thermodynamics totally blocks any possibility of evolution working as described, there's one more argument to make, and that's related to the fossil record and the presence of undecayed biomolecules amid fossils. The same principles that block the building of polymers inexorably dismantle them. The role of entropy in chemical reactions is very well studied. We know how this stuff works. And we know that when you have high free energy, that those molecules want to go down to a level of low free energy. And so they want to break down into their constituent parts. It's chemistry. And the difference in free energy is what drives that. Now other conditions can be introduced to remove entropy constraints and speed up the breakdown even more, such as the presence of water, oxygen, heat, pH. Um, for example, digestion is molecular breakdown by design. And we even have you know, microbes involved in that. But there we're trying to make them break down and they do break down over time anyway. There's this, this biomolecular decay that will happen eventually and there's nothing we can do to stop it, only slow it. Constraining this breakdown is difficult, even limiting it. Tissue preservation science is really an exercise in futility but it is very thoroughly studied. They're trying very hard to find ways to preserve tissue. Experts have tried various ways to prevent chemical decay, and experiments have included cross-linking, freezing, drying, isolating, and creative ideas like Maillard reactions, and iron-mediated cross-linking. They've come up with all different ideas for, and, and try to make biological tissue last longer. But when the free energy differential between reactants and products is substantial, as it most definitely is with these really big molecules, we're right up against the second law. They want to break apart. <laughs> because high free energy is such a low probability arrangement. Low free energy represents a high probability arrangement. And so eventually that's going to break them down. Now, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Brian Thomas that I mentioned before, and he has explained that they have done uh, lab experiments and they have tried every which way to, to get the, the breakdown process to go slower. And based upon this, with just theoretical numbers, not conditions that you can really even get in the laboratory, but he's, he says that the most that even collagen could last would be 900,000 years if everything was absolutely perfect. And that's only theoretical because there's never conditions that are like that. But under more um, expected conditions, the maximum age under those kind of conditions would be 10 to 30,000 years for these kind of molecules. Now, most of them are going to be destroyed way before that, but 
if any are going to last, this is the kind of range you're talking about as being a, a maximum. But may, many of you know about what happened in 2005 when Mary Schweitzer got into a dinosaur bone and found soft tissue in there. Not possible, folks. Not if it's 70 million years. And it was very shocking to everyone. Uh, it was called a dangerous discovery. She went on 60 Minutes. It was big news. And um, there, there have been more discoveries since. Um, there's been actual blood cells uh, evident under a microscope and, and blood vessels. There was, there was another situation uh, in 2014 where marine worm tubules were being studied by evolutionists and they came across these tubules that were made of proteins and chitin molecules. Well, those molecules were supposed to be half a billion years old, like early Cambrian. <laughs> they still exist, they're still intact. The, pr the proteins are still intact. Uh, it's just astonishing. The words that they used here was the organic material. Now, I don't think these guys were even thinking about the age of the earth. They were just concerned about their, their marine worms. But in the process, they have admitted that they've got original tissue in a half a billion year old um, so-called fossil. Uh, we had one more recently in 2020 about, um, uh, I think it was a duck-billed dinosaur. And uh, they found actual evidence of DNA inside the nucleus of the cells. So, I mean, it's pretty extraordinary. So up to date, now we have over a hundred different papers describing original tissue being found amid fossils. Uh, just amazing um, how, so the question is how can so much short-lived material persist in so many fossils, given the second law of thermodynamics? All this goes clearly against the grain. The majority of PhD scientists are entrenched in their deep time paradigm. And so, but it should not be forgotten that there's more than 250 scientists that are convinced the Earth is much younger. And it's an important point that absent historical documentations, age is an inference, not a measurable property. Age is always inferred from assumptions and in light of the effects of the second law. And with observations about decay rates and present decay states, the resulting um, the result is not knowledge, but unconfirmed inference. Did you know that the law of increasing entropy allows us to make use of hundreds of processes as natural clocks? Yet the ages rendered from these natural clocks are all over the board. Rarely do any two methods agree, and never do they all agree. Um, all different kinds of methods for dating things. It's not just the ones they want to cherry pick. 90% of these natural clocks give ages that are too young for evolution. And yet 90% of scientists think it's the reverse. It's not true. What we find is a lot of scientists are believing other scientists who believe other scientists who believe other scientists. They don't really have firsthand knowledge about how reliable these age dating methods even are. They're just assuming. Just because they're a scientist doesn't mean that they know. And, and what we do know is that Entropy can increase incredibly rapidly. And the absence of constraints, that's what happens, like a pop balloon. It's diverse constraints that slows it down. So I believe our thinking about these ages has been wrong-headed. These inferences are maximum ages, not absolutes. And I don't condone ignoring any science. They cherry pick, we don't. We accept all the science. But the clock data should be understood as being upper limits, not absolute dates. And when we accept them as upper limits, then we find that the, the, what controls are the shorter dates. So like what if you um, go diving for uh, an old ship and you find a treasure chest and you have all these old coins in it, but then you pull out and there's a, a 2018 half dollar in there. So when did the ship sink? It wasn't a long time ago, folks, because the, it's controlling. The youngest age is controlling. Or like if you, I think this was in uh, the ICR book, it was about uh, digging into an Egyptian mummy and finding a ticking clock inside the body. And it was still ticking. What would that tell you about the mummy? It's not 
quite as old as you thought it was, right? Now let me illustrate it with, with coffee. Hot coffee, um, if you like it, then you, I don't, but if you like it, then sometimes you want to keep it in a thermos so that you keep it hot. If it's a good thermos, you could put it in there and it would stay hot for maybe a whole day and the next day it would still be hot. But would you ever expect to have hot coffee in a thermos last a year? If that's sitting on the table for a year, is it going to be hot when you get to it? No, even the best thermos isn't going to hold the heat for a year. This is the second law of thermodynamics. It's not going to taste good when you try it. And yet when you cut in, or when these scientists cut into dinosaur fossils, it's really just, and they find soft tissue, it's really just like finding a thermos of coffee that's still hot. And they say, oh, isn't it amazing? This coffee lasted, uh, stayed hot so long. 70 billion years. No, 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 no. That didn't happen. <laughs> Sorry. Same way with the biomolecules. Okay, we have the science of the, <laughs> of the free energy and these, these big molecules, they break down. We have a limit on the age and so many scientists are saying that things are old, but I have to say, no way, Jose. Um, evolutionists say that fossils have to be millions of years old or evolution won't work. But that would mean the second law and the science is wrong, so they can't accept that. So they keep doing their imaginative storytelling. But imaginative storytelling seems to get preference over scientific law. But the second law is law. So evolutionists love to say that their paradigm is, is king. They're king of the world. They, you know, and uh, because we have so many that agree with us, then it must be true. So the, the naturalist, the materialist point of view uh, is the one that reigns. And I've had arrogant evolutionists say, oh well, if you think evolution is false, you better write a paper and go out and collect your Nobel Prize um, because everybody else knows that evolution is true. Well, of course, they're trying to be insulting. But <laughs> no, neither I nor anyone in this present time could aspire to that kind of an honor to disprove evolution because it's already been done. The law was established in the 1800s by Boltzmann, but really by others too, Clausius, Boltzmann, uh, you have Maxwell, you have Gibbs, and, and then a little later you had Planck, and they all were part of establishing the second law of thermodynamics. And this law disproves Darwinism. I don't want to paint it as if Boltzmann um, knew he was disproving evolution. He didn't know enough about evolution and frankly he was still learning about the second law uh, at the time he was alive. So he wasn't arguing against evolution but now that we know what the law says it absolutely proves that evolution is impossible. Math is the math. The burden of proof is not on others to disprove evolution. It never has been. The burden of proof is always on the one making the claim against the established law. Increasing entropy is scientific law. So, if you think natural selection can preserve anything, prove it. Increasing entropy is scientific law, so if you think entropy transfer mechanism that can build a genome, prove it. Increasing entropy is scientific law, so if you think natural selection can build huge delicate biomolecules, prove it. Increasing entropy is scientific law, so if you think huge delicate biomolecules can endure longer than a million years in fossils, prove it. Evolutionists have nothing, yet so many scientists persist in ignoring science. The second law is law. It's not obscure. It's not esoteric. It's important. It's not just a superficial argument against materialist evolution. Rather, it's part of the mathematical fabric of reality. It's everywhere we look. And we are all dependent on it constantly, even if we are not aware of it. Every time we toss a salad or stir a can of paint, we're 
depending on the second law. Every time we breathe, we depend on that carbon dioxide not staying around our face, but dissipating, and for the oxygen to come in so that we can breathe in oxygen. We count on the second law. It's essential. We need it to, to survive. It's the reason that everything decays and dies, but it's also the reason that anything can live. If you look in the mitochondria, you see that it's a probability gradient across a membrane where the, the protons pass through and they power these ATP synthase turbines that create ATP uh, from ADP and power, uh, give the energy for life that lets us move our muscles and blink our eyes, all because this kind of stuff is going on inside the cells. And it all depends on the second law of thermodynamics to make that turbine even work. Now, I know that some creationists have suggested the second law of thermodynamics was the curse that God established at the fall. But I strongly disagree. The second law is math. And I believe math is a reflection of the character of God. I'm glad to hear we're going to have a presentation on that in March. Is it March? He doesn't change. We very much need it to be true for our own survival. The law winds down what God winds up. The scripture says that in him all things hold together. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Only he can make all things new. He is the one who gives us mercies that are new every morning. The curse is when God withholds some of his renewing power and allows decay to follow the math. The curse is not the math. Understanding the second law is the very reason materialists went looking for the beginning of the universe in some grand explosion because the universe is observably randomizing with time just as the law states. If we rewind time we get to a beginning. That is very true. Yet a big bang is no solution at all because bangs randomize things. They don't build things. There must be an ETM for the universe. I believe his name is Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you that you are the ETM of the universe. Thank you, Lord, for the way that you made everything, for who you are, for the mathematics that's within your very nature. We thank you that you have allowed us to discover so many things like this that just makes us marvel. It makes us fall down and worship you because of how great you are. 